All right, guys. Another fantastic guest today and a fellow Regnery author who's trying to take me off my rightfully held throne at Regnery. Michael Knowles, how you doing, sir? Oh, I'm doing very well. Better now that I get to be joining you. Well, aren't, you are just so full of charm. You got that radiant <laughs> smile going. You're like the next <laughs> Kill me. Today, I basically spoke to Kill Mead first and then you. Yeah. And, I, and I told my wife, I said, you know, Kill Mead has this radiant smile. And the guy that I'll be speaking to next might be dethroning him as the, the, the most charming <laughs> smile. So there you go. That's very kind. Thank you. And, you know, I, I will say that I think where Kill Mead's got me beat is that he can be, uh, you know, bright and, and happy at about five o'clock in the morning. And that does not work quite as well for me. I think you got to do a little later in the morning for me. <laughs> All right. Let me just do a very brief introduction. So you're host of the Michael Knowles show uh, at The Daily Wire. You wrote two books. Uh, the first one, let me mention it, Reasons to Vote for Democrats. This is a book that you spent quite a bit of time researching. I'm, I really want to hear about how you went about, you know, I mean, some of the words in that book. I mean, I had to go to th 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 thesaurus every second. And then your most recent book, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. Why don't we start with the first book? Uh, tell us a bit about it. Well, it was a book I spent about 27 years at that time researching in about 27 seconds writing, uh, it begins with an epitaph of uh, Thucydides, who says, this is not an effort to win the applause of the moment, but a contribution for all time. It has a very extensive bibliography to back up its, its arguments uh, for all of the reasons to vote for Democrats, a comprehensive guide, and it does not have any other words in the entire book. <laughs> uh, I, I did mention this on your show, but it's worth repeating here. The, 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 the manner by which I first heard of this brilliant empty book is that in my own book, I have a section where I talk about the lunacy of postmodernism. And in there, I recount the story of having gone to a, uh, a museum, the Carnegie Museum. This was around the mid 90s, maybe 96. And I was visiting a friend who was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, as I was making my way through the uh, exhibits, there was a painting an empty canvas painting, which of course I understood what it meant, right? It's postmodernist art. Who are we to judge art? I got very upset and irate. I demanded to speak to the curator. They brought some, you know, helpless hack to, to speak to me, to, to placate me. And she said, but don't you see, sir? Look, we're having a conversation and so on. Uh, and then I pushed that point further when I actually pointed to some actual full exhibits that were of invisible art. And so in my inimitable sarcasm, I wrote, this was in the first draft, I wrote, well, for my next book, I plan to simply release a book of empty pages and then the, the, the readers can decide how to go about, you know, incorporating words. And then my editor said, well, I'm sorry, but that has already been <laughs> done by Michael Knowles. So there is a reference to you in the book. So again, you are beating me to the punch, sir. I love having a citation by a very serious intellectual, uh, not for this book, but for my original magnum opus. That's a great, that is a great <laughs> honor for, for that work. All right, let's, uh, let's drill down into the current book. Give us the big synopsis, and then we'll go into different directions. Give us the big story of that book, latest book, Speechless. I, you know, so this current book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, in many ways, I think it has a, a quite a lot of relation to the parasitic mind and a couple of other works where people are beginning to uh, take a look at uh, the way that our intellectual life has been just totally hollowed out in the United States and in the West more broadly, and the cultural effects that this has had. And I, so I specifically took up the issue of speech. I thought if you write one book without any words, I, then it's only fair that your follow-up is entirely about words. And so the, the book is on this question of, of the speech control, the speech codes, political correctness, censorship. We know that they're all related, but I, I actually think that we've gotten it pretty wrong in, the, in the, our telling of what PC or wokeness or cancel culture is. So I traced it, the history of it. Most people think PC goes back about 30, 40 years. Some say it goes back even further to the 60s. I think it goes back further than that to at least the 1920s. And so I, I just trace that history out in a way that I think is clear enough for people to see the intellectual connections, the way that ideas have consequences and they influence other ideas and they influence other groups. But then I took this history because I didn't think that there had been a, a really popular history of this topic yet. 
And then I, I thought, okay, what is it that we're really dealing with? Because I think a lot of people believe that political correctness is a battle between free speech on the one hand and censorship on the other. And I don't think that is quite right. I don't, when we talk about cancel culture, yes, we're talking about censorship, but I think we're talking about a very specific kind of censorship. And I also tried to grapple with this problem, which is we've been fighting political correctness for at least 30 years on the right. Donald Trump launched his presidential campaign. He said the, the thing that's killing our country is political correctness. And yet, the harder we seem to fight, the more we push back, the worse things seem to get. And now we can't even th discuss the difference between a man and a woman. Now we can't, uh, very simple things that we, we all agreed on until very recently. So why is this? And my central observation in the book is that political correctness poses a trap whereby either way we react to it, we end up advancing the politically correct agenda. Either way being, one, you can acquiesce and give in to the new standards. Obviously, that will advance the program. Or even the more stalwart conservatives who dig in and they say, I won't take on the new standard. I'm a free speech absolutist. You can't tell me what I don't think anyone should be able to tell anyone else what to say. I think even they end up advancing political correctness because I think PC is a purely negative campaign to destroy traditional standards, to upend our traditional way of life. And so whether you give in to the new standard or you abandon standards entirely, either way, the, the left has gotten what it's after, namely the obliteration of traditional standards. And so I think we're, we're, right now we're in a situation where we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So before we get into, so if these two strategies don't work, then one would hope that you've offered a solution that does work. But before we get to that, can you give us exemplars of conservatives that fall into each of those two camps not because we're trying to name people and shame them but because many people may not have a sense of what do you mean by this type of uh, approach versus that one who would be the the prototype of each of these two approaches i really don't want to be mean to david french because you know <laughs> he and i have always had a nice relationship but look he he has staked out his position on this topic in a in a very extreme way and so I feel it would actually be disrespectful not to give him credit for it. The David French position is that we cannot ban Drag Queen Story Hour <laughs> because if we tell perverts that they're not permitted to twerk for little children at the library and in their schools, why then the right, the, the left rather, might go tell the right that we can't go to church on Sundays. And first of all, just as a practical matter, they already are telling us we can't go to church on Sundays. <laughs> They've done that for about a year now. So uh, that objection, I think, is off the, off the table already. But even in theory, if, if we really cannot distinguish between twerking for little kids and going to church, if we don't possess the moral conscience and the faculties of reason to do that, that's fine, I guess, but then we need to acknowledge that we cannot govern ourselves. <laughs> if, you, if you do not possess those two things, reason and moral conscience, then the, the process of self-government is not possible because in self-government, we persuade one another, we debate, we try to, to work together to come to some conclusion about what is good and what is true, and then we, we enact that in our society. This is why John Adams says that the Constitution is built for a moral and religious people. He's not being a scold and he's not being superstitious. He's stating a plain fact of government. You, you need to possess those qualities in order to rule yourself. So I would say that's the David French position. I sometimes, when I'm feeling less charitable, I call it the squish position. Uh, then, then there's another one, which is the, maybe you'd call it the arch libertarian free speech absolutist position, with, namely the idea that we can never tell anyone else that they need to watch their words. We can never say that certain words are off limits because let's say, we recognize certain taboos in society. We recognize that societies always have limits. Uh, so they would say, no, gosh darn it, you know, get off my lawn and you've got 17 guns and you know, you're know you sort of that, that caricature from uh, say, Parks and Recreation or something like that, the Ron Swanson caricature. Okay, then I think there is a third option. And I think the third option is not the squish position and it's not the super duper you know, caricature of a libertarian position. I think it's the conservative position. Namely, we have a great speech tradition in America. We pr protect huge swaths of speech, more so than virtually any other country on earth. Obviously, certain things are off limits because speech regimes necessarily have limits, namely threats, fraud, obscenity, sedition, these sorts of things. Defamation. But we still have, 
de defamation. I mean, there, you know, there are a fair number of, of areas of speech that are off limits, but still we have, we have great protections for them. And we recognize that there will be taboos. So for instance, in the 1950s, we canceled communists. They, there was the, the cancel culture of 70 years ago. It, it, we had obviously major trials, people like Alger Hiss, who had infiltrated the government, was working on behalf of a foreign government. They had infiltrated Hollywood. There was a Hollywood blacklist. It remains controversial to this day. Uh, but we, you, you could be canceled if you were a communist in the 50s. Today, you will be canceled if you are not a communist. <laughs> so it's the, the fact of canceling has not changed. It's, it's the standard that has changed. You see this really with someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones at the 1619 Project. She very brilliantly, uh, uh, you know, she may have a completely mistaken thesis on the role of slavery in the American Revolution. That's just a complete lie. But her project is quite brilliant in as much as she says she aims to reframe American history. She's trying to reframe the standards of the country, the national self-understanding, and conservatives either could push back and say, no, here is our political vision. Here's what we think is good and true and beautiful. But instead, we, we've, we've lost the confidence to do that. Maybe we've lost the, the moral vision to do that. And so you, you vacillate now between the squishes and the people without standards. And either way, the left is going to continue to advance its march. I mean, uh, one of the ways by which one can have a different reading of certain, you know, factual historical realities is through the liberating framework of postmodernism, right? Because by, by adhering to postmodernism, by rejecting the idea that there are objective truths, whether they be scientific truths or historical truths, by placing uh, my truth above the truth, and there is a philosophical framework that allows me to do that, then I could have something like the, uh, the project in question, right? Because who are you to state what is true or not, right? So do you cover postmodernism? I mean, I know that I, I, in the parasitic mind, I tend to focus, as you said in, in, in your first uh, response, to the first 40, 50 years, recognizing, though, that some of the idea pathogens are, are go back earlier but do you spend any time and forgive me if i'm asking this and and i'm showing you that i haven't read the book carefully i only received a working e-copy two days ago or day yesterday so so <laughs> forgive me if i only skimmed through it uh do, do you focus at all on postmodernism in your book i do yes and i cover a, a lot of the associated academic movements so postmodernism deconstruction post-structuralism critical theory. Now we talk a lot about the derivation critical race theory. It's all these really kooky academic movements that, that more or less redound to your point, which is the denial of objective truth. And this, this is so at the heart of the left's word games. This is so at the heart of political correctness, because the premise of political correctness is that by redefining the words, you can redefine reality. I think of someone like Jacques Derrida, who said there, there is no outside text. It's one of these very yeah, strange yeah, French course. phrases. But he's saying basically it's just words, words, words. It's the line that Hamlet utters when he pretends to be insane. Now academics are uttering it with a completely straight face. And, and of course you can't do it, but it, it does lead, I think inevitably, to the, the kind of crazy movements you're seeing today. We talk about the radical liberation of, of redefining reality. Well, now that has come down to redefining, redefining one's own human nature. Now you have men who are saying, I'm, I'm being liberated from this prison of a body that I'm locked in, I'm now really a woman. There was just a man, he's a, a white British guy, who says he identifies as Korean, and he, he was just now been liberated the surgeries, from his right? British body. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 I've seen, I, I saw the, the images, rather disturbing. Uh, well, when I'm, so you're right that there are some very natural links between your, your recent book, Speechless, and, and The Parasitic Mind, and you're talking about liberating. Well, one of the things that I tried to do in trying to identify some commonality across all of the parasitic ideas that I, you know, list in my book is to try to come up with what well, what makes all these parasitic ideas similar. And and here I like to draw the analogy with cancer, right? So different cancers behave di very differently. So, uh, you know, uh, melanoma might be very different from uh, prostate cancer, might be very different from, uh, you know, uh, lung cancer. But yet what they do share in common is the unchecked cell division. So there is 
Mm. Beyond the, the differences, there is some fundamental similarity. So what is fundamental, fundamentally similar across various idea packages like postmodernism, militant feminism, social constructivism? Well, what I argued, so to speak to your point about being liberated from your body, I argue that each of these idea pathogens free us from the pesky shackles of reality, right? Be, yeah. So, so I can be freed from the constraints of my genitalia by self-identifying. And that, by the way, and saying that doesn't mean that you don't recognize that there is such a thing as gender dysphoria, and it doesn't say that you, you don't want people who are transgender to to live free of bigotry. But it says that in many cases, the instantiation of these parasitic ideas stems from a rejection of reality, a freeing from the shackles of reality. Let me just give you one or two quick other examples. Social constructivism, the idea that we are all born with empty minds and with equal potentiality, frees me from the possibility of knowing that my son might not grow up to be the next Michael Jordan. If only I had hugged him enough, or if I didn't hug him too much, or I gave him the right schedule of Big Macs, or or not given him Big Macs, he could have been the next Michael Jordan. So he wasn't born with any innate, uh, you know, mm-hmm. weaknesses that would not allow him to instantiate his full potential as a future NBA star. So each of these pathogenic ideas starts off in a sense with kind of a noble idea, yet delusional, mm-hmm. and then it metamorphosizes into complete lunacy. H- how does what I just said fit within some of your framework? Well, there's a, a very important point. I discussed Whitaker Chambers in the book, who is now somewhat forgotten, though he was a very important conservative writer, one of the early guys at National Review. He's r- responsible for getting Alger Hiss thrown in prison, uh, or, or convicted, rather. Uh, Whitaker Chambers was an ex-communist spy who became disillusioned by communism and flipped and became a conservative warrior. And Whitaker Chambers, in his wonderful book, Witness, uh, describes communism as, as very misunderstood. He says people think that communism is a new ideology. It's not. It's the, the great alternative faith of mankind. It is the faith that began in the Garden of Eden when the serpent told Eve, ye shall be as gods. The idea that we can totally control uh, our, the universe, that we, that we can redefine reality. You see it uh, especially in very popular New Age ideas. I remember when that book, The Secret, Yes. Was popularized. You remember, I mean, it became a big <laughs> Oprah book club bestseller. Of and the the central idea of the of the secret is this Gnostic heresy that says that you can control the universe. <laughs> that you you can force God to succumb to your will, for instance. And you see a, a similar argument here with the rise of transgenderism, which is itself a Gnostic ideology that suggests that the physical reality of, of the world has nothing to do with the deeper truth. That actually, the, the deeper metaphysical thing is, is who you really are, and your physical body is, is sort of evil if it's not, not in accord with that. So you see various versions of this same idea. It's the, it's the motivating principle behind communism and behind all of these sort of pseudo-academic movements that really exploded on campuses in the 1960s and 1970s. And, and where I think they derive from, by the way, is a line from Karl Marx to Arnold Ruga, who, who and he says that we need, that radicals need to engage in the ruthless criticism of all that exists. <laughs> that, that, to your point, yeah, you know, the, the reality is not, not good enough. <laughs> the reality is, is terrible. We need to overcome it. And, uh, and that's where, I mean, that's directly where you get critical theory and critical race theory. But I think this is also why all the statues are coming down. I think this is why people are now disrespecting the flag and every established institution. We, we need to uh, overcome the world in order in order to liberate ourselves. Well, I mean, I, I've drawn an analogy uh, in bringing down the statues to, uh, say, in Islam, where anything that is pre-Islamic, I mean, is tainted, right? It was in darkness. And then Islam came to liberate us, us kuffar, us infidels, right? And therefore, there is a reflex, say, Many Westerners may only remember the the Taliban blowing up the Buddhist uh, statues, but that history has existed since since Islam has existed, where you get rid of the existence of prior cultures, prior heritage, because the clock should start with Islam. I think that reflex exists in all utopian movements, right? So the progressives are doing something very similar, right? The clock should, I mean, the U.S. is is mortally tainted. It is part of an instantiation of some ugly original sin, and therefore we need to erase the past and start the clock from now. Do you, do you see a similar reflex in both of these movements? 
Certainly, and, and Christianity grappled with this question too in the early centuries of Christianity. Basically, do we need to trash the pagan world? Do we need to forget the classical world and just move on now after the incarnation? Or do we have something to learn from yeah. the pagan world? And this is obviously a very, very important question to St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas sort of baptizes Aristotle. And so Christianity takes this view that actually even the, the pre-Christian cultures can intuit something about uh, ultimate reality because of logic, because there is this sort of divine logic to the universe. There's objective reality and things make sense. And you don't get that in Islam. Actually, in the Regensburg Address, to my mind, the greatest address of, of the millennium, because we're only about 20 years into the millennium, but it's really, really good, given by Pope Benedict at the University of Regensburg. He, he is quoting an Islamic theologian and historian who says that the difference here between Christianity and Islam is that the Christian God is a God of logic, whereas Allah is pure will, pure willfulness. So if Allah wanted his followers to worship idols, he could make them do that, and that would have a certain coherence within, within Islam. But if, if your God is, is a God of logic, then you would not want to blow up all of the, the classical <laughs> right. statues or anything like that. And I think we're now moving into a politics of pure willfulness, the idea that, you know, that the classical conception of politics is that man is the political animal because we have speech. This is a central issue of, of speechless. And so we can persuade one another and we have reason. But if you lose that, if you lose the belief in the objective reality to which words refer, if you lose the belief that words really convey anything other than your own biased, bigoted interest, uh, then you, you lose politics and you descend into roving tribes of grunting animals, basically just trying to club one another over the head. And I think I've pretty accurately described politics now in, in 2021. <laughs> I'm going to come back to uh, the historical treaties because you've actually introduced me to at least one name that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, maybe I should be ashamed that I didn't know who it was. Can you guess who I'm thinking of? The one name in Speechless? In Speechless. Uh, and as you, it's Antonio Gramsci. I oh, did, Gramsci, yes. I didn't. I, I mean, the Frankfurt School, of course. I knew uh, Herbert Marcuse. I knew, uh, and so on. But so I want to. I want to come back to this. But since we're on religion, we just touched on Christianity and Islam. I know that you are a a, a man of faith. I am much less so, even though I am very very committed to to my 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 Jewish roots. But. People are oftentimes confused. How, how could you? How could you be a Jew and not much of a believer, and so on? And and there are very clear ways by which you can be both. Most of the most famous Jews were not very strong believers. But so, if you were to try to build a bridge in selling your important message to to those heathen atheists out there who are lost in this non-believing world, I mean, surely there is a way for all of your points to still stand uh, on their own merits without necessarily incorporating the religiosity element, or, or no, it can't be. No, I, I think that many of the arguments can be perfectly well appreciated by an atheist or someone who is Jew-ish, as you would describe yourself. We, we refer, all, all of my secular Jewish friends, we say they're Jew-ish, emphasis on the ish. Uh, but, but I think actually because of this point we were just describing uh, of the differences between Christianity and Islam, what we're recognizing is that there, there is a logic to the universe. Now, if you deny that there is a logic to the universe, if you, if you deny that there is uh, some kind of order to things and that we can know things about the world, even with our own imperfections as fallen men, if you deny that and you kind of descend into the radical skepticism that so much of our culture has descended into, then I think you're lost. Then it's going to be very difficult. And, and I know a lot of the left has done that. So the, the main place where we, you and I would defer would be that we both agree that there are truths, yet, but we, the originator of those truths, we place them on different shoulders, right? So I might say I can explain uh, innate truths of human nature using basic fundamental principles of evolutionary theory. And then you would add and say, but where does this evolutionary mechanism come from? There must be some grand designer. So, th so that would probably be the main place where we would defer. But that, in a sense, is less important than at least agreeing that there are universal truths that we can uncover. 
Right, because, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I think it's important to talk ultimately about first principles and all these sorts of things. But for the political question at hand, as long as we're basically seeing the same thing right now as things are existing, that I think is the much, much more important issue. And so that I, I suspect plenty of people who are agnostic or not particularly religious or, or even some atheists uh, who are in kind of the middle or, or even a little on the right or on the center left, I think that this book is 100% accessible to them. For people who like Derrida, perhaps, or like some of these other, you know, radical academics who just say, nope, sorry, there's no, you know, politics is, is interest and power, uh, th then I think it's going to be it's going to be much harder because arguments don't have any meaning for them. So I guess books in general won't be won't be particularly yeah. important or, or persuasive. Well, it, it's interesting that linking politics to human nature. Well, linking anything to human nature is within my scientific wheelhouse because I apply evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study human behavior in general and consumer behavior in particular. And, but linking it specifically to politics, E.O. Wilson, the famous uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, famously said uh, of communism and socialism, he said, wonderful idea, wrong species. Because what he meant to say <laughs> is that he's, a, he's an entomologist by training. He studies social ants. And in the social organization of social ants, you have one reproductive queen and then everybody else is equal. So it is a perfect manifestation short of that queen of communism or socialism. So to, so to decouple, whether it be products that we sell on the market or uh, shows that we create or political systems that we defend, if we decouple them from our understanding of human nature, eventually these will fail. And so let me give you a, a quick example. Uh, if you believe that uh, there are no innate sex differences between men and women and that all of the products that we choose is simply due to socialization, then you end up with the following real example. So romance novels are almost exclusively read and consumed by women all around the world. There isn't a culture that we found where it isn't predominantly women who read it, okay? And one thing that's common across all romance novels is the prototype or the archetype of the male hero. He's always the exact same guy. It's as if you plagiarize the exact same guy in every single romance novel. Well, a super progressive romance novel company wanted to create a new form of romance novels where, <laughs> where the archetype of the male hero was not prone to toxic masculinity. He sucks his thumb, he cries, he's sensitive. <laughs> Uh, he watches Bridges Jones' diary uh, obsessively. Well, guess what happened to that product line? It failed because it was perfectly decoupled from an understanding of human nature. Women fantasize over certain types of guys for a reason. It doesn't come from magic. And there is no amount of advertising budget is going to alter, is going to create the malleability in consumers. Same thing with political systems. We can try communism and socialism in a million different ways, in a million different cultures, but ultimately it's going to fail because it is antithetical to human nature. What do you say? Yes. No, I, I think this actually gives me a great deal of hope. Publishing trends are giving me some hope on how to overcome this politically correct establishment. Because I, I say this not to brag, but I'm very pleased that people have gone out and ordered Speechless, and it's, it's doing very well in terms of sales. Somehow your book is, I think you wrote this book like 20 years ago at this point, and yet the book is still just selling like hotcakes all Thank the time, you. and deservedly so. I mean, I'm very pleased to see that. Thank you. There are a number of other books in, in this vein that uh, continue to, to be really pretty good sellers, even though the entire establishment is against them. Yes. <laughs> and even though they're now kind of pushed to the, to the fringes, the majority of people seem to like it. And so th this actually does go back to Gramsci. Uh, Antonio Gramsci was the head of the Italian Communist Party. He was a, 1920s. A yes, in 1920s. Actually, Mussolini threw him in prison. Uh, you know, among the many terrible things Mussolini did, this this was up there because uh, not because Mussol not because uh, uh, Gramsci didn't deserve it, but because uh, Mussolini focused Gramsci's mind to write his most influential work, which are the, the prison notebooks. And it was bizarre at the prosecution of Antonio Gramsci under Mussolini, the prosecutor said, we need to stop his mind from working for 20 years. And then what did they do? They gave him a pen and paper like a bunch of idiots. And so we, now we got this book out of it. And uh, his, his writings were really influential because what Gramsci understood was cultural hegemony. He understood 
that the, the Marxists had failed to really incite revolutions because they did not have a grip on the common sense. You know, they had all these great theories for how to liberate the oppressed people, but the oppressed people didn't like them very much. The oppressed people, it turned out, liked their own traditions and their own communities and their own countries. And so what, what Gramsci called for was a war of position uh, whereby, you know, contrary to say a war of maneuver where you just advance and retreat and so forth, a war of position is one where you, you attain positions of power throughout the established institutions. And then once you've got that power established, you can wield it in a way disproportionate to your ideological numbers. In the 1960s, this was then reformulated by Rudy Dutschka, who's a, a student radical. Uh, he, he was reading Gramsci through Mao, and he said that the radicals needed to engage in the long march through the institutions, which is now a very popular phrase on the right. So you, you've got this, this radical movement here. And you know, I know the phrase cultural Marxism is, has become a very loaded phrase. And I think in some ways it's not even that useful beca basically because of this. But at this point, Wikipedia, as the symbol of the liberal establishment, is denying that the movement exists. And it's just bizarre. They, you know, there were many Marxist thinkers who wrote specifically about cultural matters, like Antonio Gramsci, who's speaking almost exclusively about the culture. And, uh, but now we're told that it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And I think, well, okay, it's not a conspiracy theory because all the thinkers tell us that that's what they're doing. And I don't think it's anti-Semitic because the godfather of it all was an Italian guy, he wasn't even a Jew. So I'm not, not quite sure how they get this idea. Um, but, I, but I do fear sometimes the right goes a little too far with the blaming cultural Marxism for everything because Cultural Marxism changes its shape over time, you know, so it begins with, say, the Institute for Marxism, later called the Frankfurt School, um, reading people, people like Gramsci, and there were actually even other thinkers before that. And, and then it, it evolves in the 1960s, where Herbert Marcuse, a Frankfurt School theorist, becomes the father of the new left. Then in the 1960s, it kind of evolves further and splits off. Then you get the rise of second wave feminism, which did a lot to advance this agenda. Later, you get the school of resentment in the universities. Later, you get these, these other sexual ideologies. So I just think it, it's not enough to blame one part of this. You need to recognize that this is a, a, a morphing movement that has evolved for 100 years now, but it always redounds to one end, namely to wither and shatter and abolish the prevailing society to upend traditional standards and ruthlessly criticize all that exists. Well, so I didn't know the term cultural hegemony from Gramsci, but if I were to look at its instantiation in the ecosystem that I inhabit, it would be called, uh, you know, 95 to 99 percent of all professors being uh, affiliated to the Democratic Party, right? I mean, depending on the discipline that you belong to, there are some great studies, some of which I cite in The Parasitic Mind, where scholars have looked at party affiliation of professors per discipline. So, you know, you have, so some of the activist disciplines, you know, sociology and uh, African American studies and so on, uh, you know, you will have. 140 to 1 ratio or whatever the number is. So, you know, so then I get emails where people say, but you're exaggerating how lopsided it is. Well, how could I be exaggerating ratios of 140 to 1, right? I mean, in, in, in medicine, for example, or in science in general, if you've got what's called an odds ratio of 1.2, like if you want to check the effectiveness of a drug and, and the odds ratio is 1.2, that means it's 20% more effective. Well, the ratio is 1 to 1.2. Here, the ratio is 1 to 140. It's like, it, it's not even <laughs> documented in the natural world. And yet people will write to me and say, stop exaggerating, stop being hyper Hyperbolic. Well, so, but that's really what Gramsci is saying, right? I need to yeah. put a chokehold on all of the key intelligentsia, you know, manifestations, and then I can play around with culture in any direction that I want to play it around in, right? Yes, and he, he also understood the importance of the educational institutions. And so he, he writes at length in the prison notebooks about uh, the importance of sort of taking over the schools. Around this time, you're seeing the development of public school as we know it today throughout throughout the West. And so he, he knows you gotta get a hold on on that. And I and sometimes on the right, I fear that we we don't know even what we're dealing with. You know, so very often you'll hear here on the right that we need to uh, educate our students rather than indoctrinate them. 
And as far as I can tell, the only difference is one of those is good and one of those is bad. But they come from the same Latin root word, right? Or, or sometimes you'll hear this from, from conservatives. They'll say, we need to teach our students how to think, not what to think. And I, I hear that and I think, okay, yes, you don't want to have just agitprop in the classroom. That's a terrible idea. But, but in order to know how to think, you do need to know certain things. You know, in order to know how to think about calculus, I need to know basic arithmetic. I need to know that two plus two equals four. These days in the classrooms, you're almost exclusively taught that two plus two equals five, and uh, you know, you'll be punished otherwise. But you, you will need to know something. You need to know the answer to the question. If you get the answer wrong, you're gonna be punished with a bad grade. You need to know, if you're studying history, you need to know certain dates. You, know, you need to know certain battles. You need to know certain facts. And then when you know those things, you can think more broadly at, you know, at a higher level about other historical questions. And so what, what left has done is really revised a lot of the actual facts throughout the academy. And, uh, but conservatives refuse even to fight back because we say, well, we can't teach people what to think. Well, we can't offer this substantive vision. Well, you know, we uh, drag queen story hour and going to church on Sunday are basically the same thing. And so be because we don't offer any substantive vision of politics or anything else, uh, nature abhors a vacuum and what's gonna fill it? It's gonna be the left's perverse sort of anti-culture that, that we're now all swimming in. Yeah, you know, I, uh, so of course I inhabit the world of adult education as a university professor, but I have young children, so I'm now seeing the indoctrination through the experiences of my children, right? And now, of course, uh, I, I, I pity the, the teachers who try to uh, indoctrinate my children because they don't know that their dad is God's side, if I can put it that way, the king of the honey badgers. And also, I'll give you a quick story. And I, and, and I t tell that story because I think it's, uh, it's a good lesson to learn for other people who might be watching or, or, view, or listening to this uh, show. So I had one of my uh, t uh, kids' teachers uh, put a avatar of BLM, at, you know, uh, she was a science teacher. And so I wrote a very polite letter to the principal saying, look, the, I have two problems with what, what happened there. Number one, you know, a, t a teacher should not be using uh, that particular medium to advertise her political views. But, but I independently of that, if you were to drill down on what BLM stands for, then it could be perfectly reasonable for people to object to those, right? Whether it be the attack on the nuclear family, whether it be the Marxist origin, you know, uh, ethos of BLM, whether it be sort of the uh, racial supremacy element, whether it be hatred towards whites. Uh, so in my case, I activated my inner honey badger. Do you think in your book, do you have some calls to action? So, I mean, okay, you diagnose certain phenomena and how they exist, but then do you offer some courses of, you know, prescriptive courses to try to combat these diseases? I do, and they're going to be extremely controversial and people are gonna to wanna to cancel me, but that's okay, because the whole book is about that process, so <laughs> I, I suppose I set myself up for it. One good way to think about this is to go back that's 70 years to the beginning of the post-war conservative movement. I'm talking about the most mainstream conservative ever there was, a man named William F. Buckley Jr. Launches the conservative movement with a book called God and Man at Yale. And everyone remembers the title of the book, but very few people remember the subtitle, which is The Superstitions of Academic Freedom. And he, he in that book, refers to academic freedom as we talk about it today, or people talked about it in the 50s, as a hoax, as a farce. It's not what people said it was. He, he says in that book that if academic freedom means that a scholar has the right to study what he wants to study, all well and good, we're, we, we agree, we're on board. But if academic freedom means that some radical political activist has the right to teach students in a classroom, paid for either by taxpayers or by parents or by trustees of the university, to teach them things that are antithetical to the school's mission to the country, to truth and justice and reality, why that is something else entirely. And first of all, just in practice, that kind of academic freedom uh, has never existed anywhere. And I trace the history of that going back to about 500 years to when the concept first developed. Uh, but moreover, it, it's not possible. You know, education is a coercive act. And the truth is arrogant. There is, if one thing is true, then its, it's opposite is not true. And actually, you do need to exclude that from the classroom. We're now told, and, and conservatives 
use the left's line here. I mean, they, they talk about academic freedom in this way, or they'll, they'll talk about how we need to maybe open up the curriculum. We need to decolonize the English department. They did this at Yale. They want to decolonize the English department by going in and kicking out all the English writers. I think, wait, isn't that, I think that's colonization. I don't think that's decolonization. I think, anyway, they've got their words backwards. But they say we need to open up and expand the curriculum. And the fact is, you know this very well, you cannot expand a curriculum because there are only so many weeks in the semester. There's only so much time. If you, every minute that you waste spent reading Robin DiAngelo or Ibram Kendi or some other preposterous trash is a moment that you will not be able to read a worthwhile author. And, uh, and you know, the, the left would never assent to this kind of academic freedom in another way. First of all, let's, nobody believes that uh, Yale University's sociology department should hire a neo-Nazi to lecture on the superiority of the Aryan race. It never would happen. It should not happen. If, if that same neo-Nazi shows up to the water cooler on Tuesday and starts yelling Zig Heil, no one thinks it would be cancel culture for him to lose his job. Everyone would be fine with it because there are standards. But the left very conveniently uh, seems to forget about standards when it helps their political cause undermining the traditional society. And yet we need to play by these rules. So I think what we need to, that's all a very long way of saying. We need to do what Ron DeSantis is doing right now in Florida and what other governors are as well. We need to say that certain poisonous, parasitic ideas, to use a phrase, uh, that have entered into the classroom need to be kicked out. There is no dignity and no virtue in permitting these parasitic ideas into taxpayer-funded classrooms to undermine children's education. And the simplest way to describe it, I suppose, would be this. Education rests on the belief that there is objective truth and we can know something about it. If you therefore add an idea to the classroom through these critical studies or, or any of the other movements that there is no such thing as objective truth, not only are you not enhancing a student's education, you're actually undermining that education. Or in the words of Chesterton, you might say, there is a thought that stops thought. And that is the only thought that ought to be stopped. Yeah, so I would I would call this intellectual terrorism, as I as I do in the parasitic mind, because so so I've been asked by a, f a friend of mine and a colleague who's a clinical psychologist. He we once went for a coffee, and he said, uh, "Do you mind if I ask you a question, God?" I said, "Sure, go ahead." He said, "You're someone who is a you know you know one of the most dogged defenders of truth and science and logic and so on. How do you then square that?" with some of your you know, favorable positions on Donald Trump. Doesn't he lie all the time? I said, well, there is a difference between lying in the following way. I have the biggest penis in recorded history, as sort of Donald Trump will do, and lying about the epistemology of truth, right? When you attack, <laughs> right? When you attack the possibility that there is a framework to get at the truth, it's called the scientific method, as do postmodernists, that's a much bigger form of lying than saying, at, at my rally, we broke all the record in the world. I mean, that could be true or false, but even if it's false, not that I'm suggesting that it's okay to fib on important matters, but that is a lot less a murder of truth than, and then, he, you know what, he, he's, to his credit, he listened, and he goes, you know what? You got me. I'm convinced. But but right. but but people don't think about the attack on the epistemology of truth. They only think about, you know, he 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 was conf confabulating about his penis size and so on, and they're they're angered by that. And here I used an argument, and if you you've read the Parasitic Mind, you 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 might remember, he is an aesthetic injury to the progressives, right? So it's, and let me, I wanna, I wanna pull this, as I don't know if I did this on your show. Imagine this is a cork of a wine bottle. So this is actually a memory yeah. stick, but imagine it were yeah. a cork of a wine bottle. So there's an expression in Arabic that says, getting drunk simply by smelling the cork of the wine bottle. What does it effectively mean? It means that I don't really have to drink the wine to get drunk. I just have to smell the cork, right? So I don't have to really listen to the words of Obama. He is just so mellifluous with his voice. Yeah. He is so lanky and majestic. He's got such a radiant smile. He must be, he must be a truth teller. On the other hand, Trump is an ogre, he's vulgar, he speaks in a brash way, he's cantankerous, he must be a bullshitter. Now, this is a trap that it, that is not some idiot on the street that's, you know, committing, falling prey to this trap. It's all of my super sophisticated, highfalutin colleagues. How can we get them to be 
unparasitized. Well, I love this this point about uh, the epistemology and the attack on sort of truth, it's, the very possibility of truth itself. Actually, to go back to Buckley, he made this point. In a, he, was, he was in a debate defending Joe McCarthy. <laughs> he was defending the cancellation of communists with Leo Chern, who is a, a neoconservative. And Leo Chern said, we want a totally open society. You, know, you and I both agree we want a totally open society. And Buckley says, not quite. I actually want society to be a little bit more closed than it is right now because I am an epistemological optimist, meaning I think that we can know some things, that in society some things have to be settled, and he said I don't see any reason to protect the liberty of a Nazi or a communist. I'm not saying I would throw them in jail, but I'm not saying I'd shed too many tears if we did either. And and what he's saying is, you know, frankly, we, we blame the left because they, they really foisted this upon us and they laid this tra the trap of political correctness, which I, I lay out in Speechless. But but we fell for it. And so I, I think the right bears a lot of responsibility, too, for for this uh, murder of, of the truth and even the possibility of truth. When, when I hear somebody tell me that we really can't know the difference between Drag Queen Story Hour and Church on Sunday. This is what I'm hearing. I mean, and, and you hear it in so many ways. Really, any moral discussion, you sometimes hear people say, well, you cannot legislate morality. I don't even know what that means. All laws legislate morality <laughs> because all, whether you're talking about abortion or you're talking about parking tickets, you're, you're making some argument, some reference to the moral order for why you ought to have something enshrined in the civil law and to have it govern society. So when, when you hear people say, and you often hear it on the right, they'll say, well, look, that's like the big Lebowski. That's just your opinion, man, you know, and your, the idea that our, our moral intuitions are just sort of random preferences, right. as though you prefer vanilla ice cream and I prefer chocolate, is, is uh, cuts at the heart not just of civil society, but at the heart of truth itself. If we, if we are really embracing that radical skepticism, it, with conservatives like that, who needs leftists? Well, the, the moral relativism is, and moral slash cultural relativism is one of the idea pathogens that I discuss in The Parasitic Mind because it is exactly that pathogen that doesn't grant people the sufficient confidence to say in an absolutist deontological way that cutting off the clitorises of little girls in some other culture over there is wrong and there is no equivocating that fact. It is always wrong to remove the sexual freedom, if not the future sexual pleasure of a little girl when she's five because of bruh, my religion. But yet the bioethicist who is steeped in cultural relativism won't have the confidence to pronounce a deontological position about that, correct? Of course. And it's, it's very tricky now because you've on both the left and the right, you've got both sides making some universal claims and uh, observing some cultural norms. And I just think the left gets it totally backwards. So the, the left now is making the universal claim that we need to encourage transgenderism in, in Zimbabwe or something like that. Uh, but, uh, but also they're not willing to stand up against, say, uh, female circumcision, you know, in some other other part of the world. And uh, on on the conservative side of things, we recognize that there there is an objective moral order, uh, but also we like to give some preference, maybe not to the level of uh, female circumcision, sure. but some pr preference to say, I don't know, trade practices in other parts of the world or some economic uh, arrangements in other parts of the world. And so, I think the most important thing when we're when we're trying to consider this this problem is that we need to be very specific. Uh, you know, we, we, I think we've been abstracting everything for decades and decades. And, you know, we'll defend free speech in the abstract. We don't have anything to say in practice, but we love free speech in the abstract. And I think what we need to get much more specific here. What is it that we want to say? What is it that we believe? You know, that I, I think part of the reason the right has failed on this is because the, the right wing has is fractured into so many different groups that agreed with one another sort of during the Cold War because we had a common enemy in the Soviet Union. But since that time, you've got the traditional conservatives, the libertarians, the neoconservatives, the populists, the this, that, and the other thing. Put a hundred conservatives into a room, they'll all somehow disagree with one another. And the only thing they've been able to agree on is, is cutting taxes. I like low taxes as much as the next guy, but if you don't offer a more serious political vision, then you're always going to be on the back foot and you're, you're always going to be losing. Are there some ideas 
that stem from the left that you wish the right had that that they are beating that you know that you, you wish that you could usurp that idea or very much like your first book where reasons to to vote for democrats was an empty book there is nothing of their ideas that you would like to borrow and incorporate within the camp of the conservatives i, I would like to take their tactics I'm not sure that I agree with them on substantive issues because I, I agree with Whitaker Chambers. I think that the left is animated basically by the serpent in the garden telling Eve that she can be a god. And so just if you, if you get that part wrong, you're probably going to get the rest of the substance wrong. But the tactics I really like. And getting back to Herbert Marcuse, this you know head of the – or father of the new left. Sure. He makes a point in this infamous essay, which people find so odious and vile, naturally so, uh, called repressive tolerance. Yeah. He says – he, he has a lot of flowery language and a lot of that kind of inscrutable German that no one can make sense of even in translation. He says that uh, basically you can't tolerate intolerance. And what this means in practice is we need to censor all the conservatives and encourage all the speech of, of the liberals and, or really the hard leftists. And so, so you look at that and you say, well, look, this obviously is a disingenuous argument. And he's you know, basically just calling for me to be ostracized and censored. But his observation is his most modest observation that tolerance can't tolerate intolerance is obviously true. I mean, this is a point that John Locke made, actually, in the letter concerning toleration. He said, you can't tolerate ideas that are going to undermine your ideas. Well, Karl Popper in The Paradox of Tolerance, right? Same thing. Yes. Yep. Popper, same thing. John Milton, actually, in Areopagitica, which is the most famous defense of free speech in the whole language, he says the same thing. In that, in that uh, bit, in that speech, he wants to uh, censor Catholics. So thankfully, that one didn't totally work out because otherwise this book wouldn't come out. But, but his point, his broader political point, I think, is fair in that the religious wars had threatened the entire kingdom. And so at a very basic level, you need some coherence or you'll, you'll undermine the free speech regime itself. I think if, if we could recognize what the left has, that a lot of these debates we're having about even language itself is, is not about free speech versus censorship quite so much as it's about what standards we are going to hold, I think that would be, be very helpful to us. And, and if we would realize, as the left does, that all these little semantic parasites, again, to use your word, really, really do matter. I, I know when, we, when we're debating, do we call Bruce Jenner a woman, or he, she, or he, or Caitlin, or this? And a lot of conservatives and middle-of-the-road people will say, oh, who cares? Who cares? It doesn't seem like a big deal to me. My response is always, the left sure seems to care. Right. <laughs> the, le the left is investing a lot of time and money and energy on these little pronouns. Why? Because the pronouns carry whole premises. Yeah. They're smuggling in this entire vision of politics, and, and we're shrugging our shoulders and trying to focus on the next tax cut. Well, what pisses me off, by the way, is not so much the compelled speech of what I should call someone else, which, of course, is something that my uh, good friend Jordan Peterson fought and became famous for. What upsets yeah. me is when you start mislabeling me. And so I'm not a cis man. I'm a man. Right. So you can decide that you want to be called they. That's fine. I'm a I'm a I'm a nice person. And if that's what that's all it takes for you to feel included, fine. I'll call you they or zigz or whatever. But once yeah. I start, once you start imposing what my nomenclature is or that of my children, yeah. then I'm starting to get pissed. Uh, I want to. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, did you want to comment on that before? No, I well, it's, uh, this is such an important point, and I think this is what people are starting to react against. Yeah. Because, yes, you know, if you're at a dinner party and some man says, I'm a woman now and I'm also Korean, and you say, okay, you know, Kim, Il, whoever, you know, I'll call you whatever pronoun right. you want. But, uh, but then, of course, in these private interactions, they don't stay private for very long. They then come on to have this very public effect. And because language is such that we have to share it. We have to have it in common. That's the most basic element of a political society. <laughs> Very soon, they, they do begin to make demands of the language that you use and the way that you are referred to. And they'll call you a sissy or whatever the new term is for what kind of man you are. And, and then we are put in the position that we have to either seem like jerks because we don't call the man who thinks he's a woman a woman, or we just give in entirely. And I think the, the way that I resolve that is I just think even that carries this hidden awful premise that lies are somehow compassionate and that truth 
is somehow cruel. You know, I mean, that, that is the fundamental argument that the left is making. And I think, wait a second, back, uh, there was a guy some years ago who said that uh, lies are actually evil and the truth will set you free. Now, that, you know, that, if we're to have any functioning society at all, we need at least to agree on the goodness of the truth. But by the way, truth is literally coded as problematic in some cases amongst the left. And I tell the example in the parasitic mind of Geert Wilders, who's a Dutch parliamentarian who's very, very anti-Islam. And he had made some comments that uh, caused him to be uh, ushered in front of the Dutch magistrate on hate speech. And so he, in his defense, he said, well, could I bring some expert witnesses that will speak to the veracity of the positions that I espoused. And the Dutch magistrate, in a truly Orwellian moment, said, it doesn't matter whether what you say is true if it demonizes others. So I can't even use the truth in my defense. That's the Orwellian <laughs> world we've come to. Okay, two last questions, and then I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, question one, so you, you went to Yale. Of course, you only went to Yale because you couldn't get into the real Ivy League school, my alma mater, Cornell University. No problem. I won't hold it against you. You know, you didn't think that you would necessarily become this media, you know, success and so on. So if there are people listening today who say, you know, I want to be the next Michael Knowles. I want to be a guy that has a footprint in the battle of ideas. Are there, is there a specific, specific pathway? I mean, there isn't a deterministic one, but are there some things that young folks who want to be the next Michael Knowles can follow to try to aspire to get to your level? Well, I'd say the most important thing is be friends with Jeremy Boring and Ben Shapiro. That's a very <laughs> important step, I would say, on that road. You know, when people, specifically about this college question, people will say, uh, should I go to an Ivy League school or should yeah. I go to one of these fancy schools? Uh, that have a brand name, and I, I think there are some advantages to that. There, there really are. It still carries some cachet in the culture, though I think, frankly, less and less so over time as these schools get kind of rotted out from the inside. But uh, yes, I think if you want to be an investment banker, you should go to Yale or Harvard or Princeton or something or Cornell or you know one of these top schools. Uh, if you want to go to law school, it helps, I think, in some cases to go to those schools. If you want to get a, a liberal education, I don't know. Maybe you can get one there, but maybe you'd actually be better off at Ave Maria College or uh, Francis. Hillsdale Student. College is doing Hill, big things. Hillsdale. Yeah. Yeah, Hillsdale would be a great one. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, there, there are a handful, St. John's, you know, there are a handful of these schools. Um, there you, you'll probably get a, a more thorough liberal education. Now, maybe you can fill in the gaps through summer programs. Conservatives are very good at think tanks and summer programs. Maybe you fill in the gap just reading later on in life. Uh, and I, I think it would behoove you to try to seek out a liberal education. I do think that's important because a liberal education is meant uh, not to turn you into a liberal, but to, to, to uh, help you make sense of your freedom, right? I mean, it's to tamp down the base passions and cultivate the virtues and, and habits that are conducive to success. So I would do that sort of thing. And I, I would, uh, you know, take, take seriously getting some of that experience, not just book learning, but street learning too. You know, if you want to be in politics, work on a political campaign or two, really see how this stuff works at the, at the lowest level. You do have to read constantly. I mean, I would, I say this as the author of a blank book there, you finished one book already during this conversation, uh, but you do need to read. I don't know anybody at the top who doesn't, who doesn't read a lot. So I, I would make sure you make time to do that. And no one has any time. You got the kid and you got the wife and you got to do this and that, but it's really important, really important to do that. And then I think the other one that's that's very important and it's hard for young people today is young people living in this culture of total liberation where we want to be whatever we want to be and we need to if i want to be a korean you know man i'll just become a korean man or something you need to take the step that's in front of you you know god can't drive a parked car and you need to work you know you need to take the step that is available to you and you might say well i'm not going to do the things that would be productive and con and contribute to society and help me now because i'm going to wait for the the nba to call and and have me join the chicago bulls uh, no that's not a good idea you you really i think need to take that step and you will find your real stride if you are going to if you are going to hit your stride you're going to find it in what you really are doing, not in the thing that you're fantasizing about. And, and that, I think, comes from taking not just the moment to moment seriously, but you need to take cultural questions seriously. And ultimately, you need to take the, the eternal questions seriously to know really who you are and what, what your role is in this cosmic order. Great pieces of advice, one of which uh, was mentioned almost word by word by Buck Sexton, 
whom I, I had him on the show recently, and it's, it's part of my bank series. I should mention all of these shows will are being exclusively carried by Pod TV. So thank you guys. They truly fight against cancel culture. Uh, he actually said that he's a voracious reader. Uh, and then I mentioned to him that uh, the biggest predictor of your child's success, uh, I don't have the reference uh, in hand, but is that how many books they grew up with in the home. And so, for example, if you look in, in, in our home, my personal library is you know, the size of, uh, you know, the Alexandria library. And, and I'm, and I'm I often will get uh, great angst because I'll walk into my study and there are still many, many hundreds of books in my personal library that I've yet to read. And I get anxious because I'm thinking there is this unbelievable knowledge out there that I don't know. And how can I get all that knowledge in this brain of mine? So I think that that in, insatiable quest for knowledge uh, is key to anything that we do. I mean, short of you being an athlete and you know, getting a, a ball, you know, a ball into the hoop. Not to imply that they're not smart, but there are some things where knowledge is not important. But for most things, more knowledge is always better. So thank you for raising that point. As a professor, I appreciate that kind of advice. <laughs> Last question. I know we were we've been you know discussing your latest book here. Are there any other projects that you're working on that you might use this platform to promote? Take it away, Mr. Knowles. I am actually on the point about books. I, I host a show at PragerU called The Book Club, and it is just a once-a-month show. I bring on people. We'll have to have you on the point. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm assuming that my invitation has repeatedly <laughs> been lost, just like the invitation to endorse your book, your latest book, Speechless, which when I looked and saw all these illustrious people and didn't see my name, it left me... Speechless. <laughs> left you speechless. Well, you know, I'll tell you what. If I do not hit the bestseller list on this, I will know why. I mean, Boom. Because I, because this darn publisher didn't even send out to get the another blurb <laughs> from the illustrious uh, Dr. Sad. But hopefully for my next one, uh, which I'm, by the way, I'm never writing a book with words again. It's too much. <laughs> it's too much. Too I can't much. possibly do it. I but uh, but we will. We seriously, we will really have to have you on the book club because uh, we do it just once a month. We only started it last year. And it's really caught on, I think, because people don't have that community anymore in which they can really grow together. So I do that. I uh, host a show with Senator Cruz called Verdict, uh, which is still uh, you know, coming out uh, regularly. It's a little hard. He's, got, he's a busy man, but we try to do one about once a week. And, uh, and then, of course, you can find my Daily Wire show, which is every single day at uh, Daily Wire. And it's the very creatively titled Michael Knowles Show. Such a pleasure talking to you. Stay on the line so we can say goodbye offline. Cheers, buddy. All right. Thank you, guys.